everyone. Welcome to the uh, Solid Waste Subcommittee uh, of the Public Works and Planning um, uh, meeting. Let me uh, read our, our usual uh, opening statement. This meeting of the uh, Solid Waste Subcommittee is being conducted electronically pursuant to Governor Bill Lee's Executive Order Number 16. I would ask for a motion that conducting the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the public health, welfare, and safety in light of the coronavirus. So moved. Mr. Thank Blair you. and Chanto. All right, Rachel, this will uh, also act as roll call, if you don't mind. Mr. Blair? Yes. Mr. Dodd? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Piercy? Yes. Commissioner P? Yes. Commissioner Sherino? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. All right, welcome gentlemen and Rebecca and Rachel. Uh, before you, you should have a hard copy of the October 14th dated RFP rough draft. And uh, this evening we are going to take a look at that uh, and begin to go through and digest and suggest any alterations or changes. Uh, our goal is to get through this in as few amount of meetings as possible so we can get this to the street and out to the uh, public. And uh, again, our desire is to uh, have all these people uh, respond to us by the uh, uh, end of the year so we can start fresh in 2021 with some real decisions to be made. All right, uh, Rachel and uh, Mac, if you would like to uh, kind of give us an overview of what this draft entails. And uh, what did I say? Oh my gosh. Well, you've been around long enough. You can probably do this, though, right? Maybe. I'll try. Okay. All right. <laughs> Becky, if you and Mac would like to uh, give us a synopsis, and then we can go through the major categories and chat about those, the floor is yours. All right. So first of all, on page one is just simply background information that came directly from the RFI. So that's information that you all have already seen. The next several pages flow through the steps that we talked about in the RFI or the actual functions as far as public education, collection, um, transportation, processing. The public education piece on this is probably a bit longer than you might have expected. I've looked at several other RFPs from other communities and there's some, some pretty specific information here. The key to it is that they would work in conjunction and partnership with your PIO. So basically you have a direct connection to them for approval for any materials and or changes that need to be made, um, distribution and that type thing. Do y'all have any thoughts or questions on public education on the front end? Take one comment. Oh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we we actually looked at um, the uh, on the third paragraph under public education. We were we went with 90 days, and I think we said maximum. I think maximum. the word was left out. Maximum should be placed in there uh, for the days of execution. We wanted to make sure because of um, <clears throat> Ashley being our PIO. Uh, through public education, she'll need that time also to network with the other PIOs of the other cities, Murfreesboro, Smyrna, and Laverne. Um, so we felt like that there needed to be some cap on it, and that's why the word maximum was was uh, that we had discussed, uh, but we wanted to give them that much time um, to where the other cities could roll that out and, and put that on their public television. Uh, stations, emails, Twitters, whatever it may be. That's it. All right, very good. And that, that reference was primarily for the um, public education plan, so it would actually be written and reviewed and seen ahead of time. On the residential collection services piece, 
This is dealing more with co uh, convenience centers. Uh, as you go from page three over to page four, you see just the MSW landfill in, ton in tons there, just straight from the RFI. I think we can add 2019. I'm sure Max got those numbers. Um, moving through the proposal for county solid waste collection services, essentially you're looking at, um, you want the full price in their bid, you want as far as what the services are they'll offer, you want them open 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sunday through Saturday. Um, they will be closed on holidays. They will have a trained attendant. So you're, you're seeing basically the steps of what you would want if someone else were actually managing or running your convenience centers, operating your convenience centers. I do need to add Memorial Day and Labor Day to your holidays. That was brought to my attention in number three. Memorial Day and what other holiday? Labor Day. Labor Day, the two Monday holidays. I've got a question on that part. Yes, sir. If we go Saturday through Sunday, seven to six, of course, I'm all about it because convenience is what they need to be but won't their entire system need to operate Saturday through Sunday because they'll be generating trash around the clock and if the other parts of the mechanism is just run five days a week, there's gonna be a stockpile of trash somewhere. Yes, sir. And so I looked at um, further on over on page eight when we start to talk about material acceptance, I had made a note, it's actually highlighted in yellow, just to, to note that if the convenience centers are open 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. seven days a week, then there either needs a place to hold on to material that can't be delivered because the facility's not open or we need a facility to be open those same hours. But, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes sir, you're right now. <clears throat> this was, um, Becky and I had a lot of discussion and, uh, concerning this. Originally, we had five years in here. I wanted to go with 20 years. What I threw out was 20 years because uh, at what point in time, we don't know who is going to uh, turn in an RFP or even if any of those 13, 20, whatever companies are interested in handling our convenience centers. Uh, so I thought it, if we just throw it at 20 years to give us some uh, room for negotiations that they may come back and say, well, we only want to do seven years. Well, it gives us that room because if we started with five, then we end up with, we only do, want to do one and then we're negotiating. So, so I went with a higher limit just to, this is for starting negotiations in the RFP. Uh, also, on the the times, you know, this varies much different than what we have today. Um, <clears throat> my position is, Mr. Chairman, is that there's not another department in county government that touches our citizens more than this one department. You can you can come downstairs and pay your taxes to TAB one time a year. You can go down, you can go across the street and vote, maybe once or twice a year, depending on what elections are there. You can go get your tags from Lisa one time a year, but our convenience centers need to be convenient. Emphasis on that word convenient. More complaints come into the mayor's office for the time that we're not open. And when you load your truck down or your car and trunk full of trash and you get there and it's closed it's not real convenient we need to make it to convenience for the times that our people work and we thought seven o'clock to six o'clock now we can negotiate that and and probably need some discussion maybe they need to be tied to the to the times that that the landfill is open so those um, dumpsters can be pulled and, and et cetera. But 
I, I looked around at Williamson County and looked at Wilson County and, and the majority of those other counties try to make it as convenient. Uh, I'm willing to go uh, when we get in and make recommendations next year in the budget. I'm willing to say if Mac needs uh, a whole other set of part-time people or maybe we need to go to full-time people. I, I don't know. The, this is up for discussion. You know, whether we negotiate convenience centers with somebody that turns in an RFP or whether we still continue to run it ourselves. But we have to start the discussion somewhere. But whatever we do, let's try to make it as convenient as possible and get more money in the budget to get people to operate these facilities. All right, well said. Becky, uh, continue on. Um, on page five, you just flow on through that you would want them to, um, picking up at number five, you would want them to direct customers, help help residents as needed, remove and ser remove service and replace the containers and compactors. You would want them to take care of the site maintenance on a daily or regular basis um, as needed. They would need to document the materials that were actually in the facility, so a lot of the things that are already done by your in-house staff and the team that you have in place now. Um, the one thing on number 10, 11, and 12, most of that is dealing with safety. Um, I think that's one of the things to note is this is one of the most dangerous industries typically in the top five every year. And so knowing that they're following, you know, specific safety guidelines, they have a safety plan in place, they do notify you all if there's an incident, especially if you maintain ownership of the properties. Um, and then at the bottom, number 14 was no part shall be sublet to anyone without your permission. In other words, you don't want them to choose someone that you may or may not approve of. On the top of page seven, you've got the, go right. ahead. Hold I'm on, sorry. Becky. A little idea of what that may look like. I've had some experience with it. Uh, the convenience center property and permits still belong to the county you know, because they're issued through the state. The equi equipment within the centers currently belong to the county. So if you're thinking you're just gonna try it for a little while, maybe you hang on to the equipment. If not, then you wanna probably surplus the equipment, let somebody else own it. Um, the center attendants would be employees of the company that's taken over. And then the, uh, the hours of operation can be whatever you want them to be. Uh, when I was in Marshall County, did waste management, we hauled those, and they were open four hours in the morning, closed for four hours, and open for four hours in the afternoon, you know, to give her a longer spread. spread. You know, you got to look at your hourly stuff. Uh, reporting is really important. So we have landfill tickets. When they get dumped, we would need to get copies of those. And usually you will with a bill anyway, so you can kind of keep track of, of what's been done. That way you're paying for whatever you need to pay for. Privatization has been done quite often. It can be done, and it's been reversed as well. So uh, when I was at BFI years ago, we took over all the Franklin County centers, and then they changed solid waste directors, and they took them all back over themselves. Uh, the luckily part of that, Mr. Hired Modrel worked for them. He hired and fired all the center attendants. He came to work for us, and when we turned it back, he went back to work for them. So, you know, so you try to keep the same people involved. Mac, will you repeat what you said about the, the equipment and the containers? Because those are currently ours, the counties, right? If, if a private company winds up running the convenience centers, you, what did you say about that equipment? Do we do we put it in a surplus? Do we lease it to them? Do we sell it to them? Is, what, what's the option? Be better off to sell that to them uh, because the equipment uh, the equipment gets a lot of wear and tear. So if you've ever been out to our landfill, we've got a lot of containers sitting out there waiting to be repaired. There's got some sort of damage to them, but we haven't bought very many new ones. We just keep repairing those. So you'd rather not have somebody else tearing them up and then you having to fix them. So let that be their equipment that they're taking care of. The, well, but you could you could lease it to them and they repair it. And as part of the condition of the lease, it's still going to be our property. Yeah, I, I agree with you that they take the employees and take that responsibility for them. 
work comp injuries and payroll and, and et cetera. But I think we go into it as open as possible and see whoever wants to bring us whatever option. And and then so then we sit down and negotiate. You, you talked about Marshall County. Um, that's a very – I used to represent Marshall County for 10 years in the Senate, and that's a very small county, so their population was not – I think we'd probably take more through Weekly Lane than Marshall County does in a week. Their, uh, their Chapel Hill Center was the busiest one. Yeah, right. Had one out belt toward Belfast that didn't go very often. No. It, well, too, in some of those areas, they just burnt their own. <laughs> yeah. How often do the compactors break down? Uh, you goes in spells, just like anybody, anything else. You can go for a while, and then they always break down on the weekend. When you don't have a mechanic available, you can't buy a hose, those type things. So well, we were working on one out at Rock Crusher today that we had a little little issue with it Sunday, but we made it through the day, and so we're trying to make sure we get it repaired before the weekend happens again. Um, that is one of the old pieces of equipment, and that compactor, that number one compactor at Rock Crusher is probably one of the original compactors purchased back in the – the early 90s and it's still in service now we've done a lot of work to it but it's still in service is the compactor the other than the trucks are they the most maintenance issue in the system yes the compactor machine itself you've got the hydraulic cylinder which we currently we have two different style cylinders so we have two spares one of each style uh, so if a cylinder goes bad, we'll switch that out, send it to be repaired, then we've got that back on hand. Uh, we've got 34 compactor machines out in, in the field uh, that we currently are using. Some of them's trash, some of them's cardboard. Uh, and there's five different motor pump configurations through the years, you know, where they've upgraded and that type stuff. So it'd be really really great to have them all identical but if you keep using the old stuff and they modernize then they're all not all they don't stay identical mr chairman uh yes chairman p just a quick question do we have a pm program back on the, these uh convenience centers compactors yes sir we do what does that entail it's usually a once a year changing of the fluid or the hydraulic fluid and then checking the hoses for fraying and things like that all right thank you chairman harris did you have a yeah. question <clears throat> comment thank you on page five mm -hmm. paragraph uh, number eight um documentation and volume of material collected can we not change that from submitted to a county rep to the public works committee absolutely paying the bills you want it to go to the representative that's going to pay them public works only meets once a month so you won't get a bill paid but every month yeah but it says these documents will be submitted to the county representative on a monthly basis so if we're going to ask them to do that then the public works will be able to step in i mean is that can we do that i mean i want public where i want to be as transparent as possible thank you it'd be part of a monthly report Chairman <laughs> Uh Yes, you are recognized, <coughs> Commissioner Piercy. Should this happen to take fold and somebody comes in and operates our convenience centers and we have no employees there and we have, it's not ours, it's theirs, though we do own the land. I would really like to see whoever does this submit to a weekly or a bi-weekly inspection of how they're clean and how they're operated to keep from having 14 mini dumps scattered all the way around the county. Because I've seen some in other counties that uh, look a whole lot worse than most of our convenience centers we have here in Rutherford County. Rutherford County's people they pretty well take pride in their job and they keep their centers pretty clean if somebody else takes it over it's just a job to them you know it's just a job so I, I would really like to see some type of submittal for an inspection you know every every two weeks probably you know just have somebody check it right around the, right around the county and check them and make sure 
because we've got one giving us a headache out there at Walter Hill, and I know the other commissioners don't want their convenience centers scattered all over the county, giving them the same headache. Thank you. So you would want a county representative to have the ability or have the um, direction that they could inspect the facilities at least once every two weeks? Correct. At least. Thank Correct. you. I'll include that. Mr. Chairman, as far as the uh, accountability factor uh, with what Commissioner Pierce had just mentioned, say we, uh, say we have an issue with, uh, with one of the sites being in maybe not disrepair, but, you know, just not, not well run, what authority or what authority would we pursue them under to make them cooperate with uh, the aesthetics of what we, what we perceive the convenience center should look like? It's a great question. Mac. I don't have an answer. Mac, Mac. All the convenience centers are permitted through the state of Tennessee, and the, the TDEC T inspectors do inspect them. They're required to inspect them at, at least once per year. Ours gets inspected probably quarterly, uh, and they look for litter and leachate issues. And, you know, they can tell that something's been going on for a while and didn't just happen today. So some of those things are pretty easy. But even if someone else was operating our centers, that permit is still the county's. So we still have the lab. It's still our the state would come to us, not not our contractor, with an issue. Well, let's let's say it's not as uh, <clears throat> as uh, offensive that it would require a T deck concern, but let's just say there's a lot of paper trash blown up against the fence and stuck, and it just it looks unsightly. Commissioner Blair has a great question. Who? Do we do we give up any power if those folks are running the convenience center under a contract? Do we still does does the inspector that comes out two times a month can he come out and say, man, your your housekeeping is horrible. You you, you need to pick this up and you've got 24 hours. And I would and then what can we do if they say, well, we're not doing it? Could be depending on how you write your contract, breach contract. Yeah. The, it's called suit training, statewide, statewide uh, universal training for all state inspectors, and the the regulated community, which is us, also is supposed to uh, uh, get certified yearly on those inspections. So whomever is doing that inspection biweekly needs to go through that training. That way, they look at the same thing the state would be looking at. Yeah. Right. Our our convenience center coordinator does the same thing. All right. So the, really, this is all part of the contract between two entities, and this would be part of the fine print as in the housekeeping part. All right. Does that sort of answer your question, Commissioner Blair? Yes, sir, except my concern is, uh, again, the accountability that if we find a problem and they do not react in an appropriate time, what teeth do we have to force them to uh, react in an appropriate time because if we have to go through the court system, yeah, you know that that can be a little lengthy. Yeah, there probably needs to be some language in there, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, that, yeah. that uh, holds them accountable for not keeping it clean or whatever else. Yeah, and, you know, uh, there's got to be a financial penalty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mac mentioned breach of contract, and after a breach of contract, there's got to be a fiscal pain. Mm -hmm. um, so that would maybe a discussion with judges and attorneys to find out or the state i don't know if the state has any limitations on what we could do or not but they, they got a field in the pocketbook is what they'd have to do sure. yes sir you're recognized i don't see why we can't treat it like a, a building inspector and the reason i say that is if you don't do and clean up then the county shuts you down and you don't have any permits or anything like that i mean i don't necessarily know what we can do but i think that we could put language in there like the mayor said and we can in have fines and then we can also go to where it's fine a fine b and then we either lock them up or put a padlock on them or, or we or we take them to court but i think it should go in that area because i mean here in the county if you don't clean up your lots and all that stuff we shut you down 
Yeah, I, I think a financial penalty where it hurts your pocketbook would be better because I wouldn't want to be in front of that that fence when you put a padlock on it and yeah. you got 10 cars full of trash. Yeah. They're still going to blame the county, not the person we locked it up on, you know. So I think we ought to make it some – Yeah. kind of like the NFL, you know. It's hefty, hefty fines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, a good, it's a good point, Chairman Harris. Uh, that, that's going to take some legal expertise to help us get to that point. All right, yeah, continue I, on. I would, I would also say, and I don't want to, to advertise or be an advertisement for, but the National Solid Waste Association of North America does offer. Um, certification for transfer stations, which a convenience center is considered a small transfer station. Um, collection, integrated solid waste management, landfill certification. So that's something that you could look at having, you know, having the primary manager or the person that oversees these sites could potentially be certified in one or, you know, several disciplines through an organization like SWANA. Okay. All right. Uh, the facility capacity, which is down on page seven, um, it actually starts just above that. When you talk about um, starting, we're starting to talk about processing and actually once you've collected the material, these are the things that we want to look at or consider regardless of the material and regardless of the processing. Um, all of it has to be collected somehow. So then you start to look at, okay, well, what are you gonna do with it? We start to look at the facility capacity we talked about what the capacity should be or the time frame. Um, we actually have kept this or tried to keep this consistent with 25 years. Facility capacity here um, could be landfill, could be transfer station, could be other type of facility. I'm not sure we've, I, I was peeking at this before the, right before the meeting the landfills in our area don't necessarily have 25 years capacity, but this is a starting point where you can start the conversation of what is the capacity, what is the expansion op opportunity or option um, you know, if it is a landfill. Now, if you're talking about a material recovery facility or transfer station, how old is it? How long do you expect it to be up and running and that type of thing as far as capacity or life expectancy? So let me make sure I understand that. So out of the get-go, when they are, if if they're building a facility, or I guess they'll have to be building a facility, they have to show us that they are building based on the projected tonnage, something that will uh, be a minimum of a 25 year capacity. Is that how I read that? Okay. Uh, basically they, if they don't own the facility, they need to provide documentation that the owner does um, does have capacity to accept the volume. Um, they will name specifically which locations, what site, um, what the address is, any backup or alternative sites. On page eight, this is where I mentioned the material acceptance earlier. Um, if you're gonna have convenience centers that are open seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., you either need to have a place that will hold the materials that are there. If the place accepting the materials is not open, then you have to have either a holding, you know, a holding location or some process or operation in place that you manage that volume until that facility is open again. Um, I think the, the, the example at point would potentially be middle point. I think it closes at noon on Saturday, is that right, Mac? at 11 on Saturday. So his convenience centers are open for a little bit till three on Saturday. But then he's gotta make sure he manages that volume and manages those sites based on the fact that he can't take it directly to the landfill on Saturday between 11 and three. Or on Sunday from 7.30 to three. Thank uh, you. The our reports, our monthly reports, if you look at the, the centers listed, there's one listed called the Hill Yard that's where all those loads go on the weekends. And if, if you see most often, that's the most busy center. Uh, going on down to the next paragraph, um, and, and we can 
we're, this is this is not the first time you're going to see this. There will be other sections that will add to it, but we can talk further about you know do do we need to have a place for holding pattern, if you will, or holding material versus do we expect a facility to be open those same hours as the convenience centers are? Um, the next paragraph or the next sentence basically just recognizes that you do not promise to deliver them a certain volume. You don't promise that you'll deliver them so many tons a day and if you don't deliver that volume, um, then they would charge you anyway or they would have, you know, penalty anyway um, because you haven't, you haven't provided the max or I'm sorry, the minimum amount of tonnage. Um, it also doesn't say there's a maximum. So basically, if you have a lot more tonnage today than, or I'm sorry, five years from now than you do today, then all of a sudden that's not part of the deal either. It's, it's just a standard, this is what we have, this is what we deliver to your facility for processing and or landfilling. Uh, it does ask that they offer a location for residents separate from truck traffic that actually goes through the facility. In other words, you don't want your residents and their residential vehicles mixed in with big truck traffic. Um, and then it does reference that county employees shall be allowed to inspect the loads at their discretion. Uh, material screening is Excuse next. Me. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, You're so recognized. starting on page seven, facility capacity. That's referencing anywhere that our convenience center debris goes. Any type of facility Period. that might be. Mm -hmm. Or they could accept the city, the current city trash trucks. Or is that, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I shouldn't go there then. Well, we're just, we're this just is the convenience at... center specifically. Yes, sir. Just county. Mm -hmm. This is just county. And it's the county uh, trucks that are leaving the school sites with loaded trucks for instance it's the dumpster it's our Your roll -off our truck. front loaders and roll-offs and and it's the proposer dealing with the material from the convenience centers yes sir all falls starts on page seven yes sir and it can be this is where a proposer might say a transfer station or a new landfill or a landfill elsewhere or a train yard this is where it starts yes okay and it's that paragraph that starts regardless right under number 15 at the top of page seven. Mr. Mayor. Mayor. You know, Mayor, I'm not sure that this residency clause might fix an issue that we've suffered through for years with people not registering their vehicles here and getting their driver's license to the proper address. I think state law is what 30 days once you become domicile that's correct so you know we've had trouble with in the past with people buying their tags you know residing here but buying from a county that doesn't have uh, the additional tag done yeah. to it so. Mac, Mac gets a lot of traffic at, at um, rock crusher that come from Bedford right um, and bring their trash so that I, I think it's time to address that might cure that 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 problem what happens is that like my car that I'm driving now I, I bought it in Bedford County but the car I wrecked just bought the tag the month before so I made the dealership use the same tag my daughter bought a car in Coffee County and it has a Coffee County tag on it so I explained to her, I said, when you renew that, you need to ask for the Rutherford County sticker. Most people do not. So some of them, actually, if you look at the regist registration, they're actually registered correctly. Just the name on the tag is incorrect. And then there's a, a resident north of here that has, actually is a resident of the county but drives a pickup truck that's, that's registered in Coffee County because he has property there. He should not be able to buy that tag in Coffee County because he's not a resident there. There's a difference in being a property owner and a residence. But I had a little discussion with him because he was upset because I kept asking him about his tag. And I said, we're going to ask you every time you come to what they know me. It doesn't matter. You need to get the right tag. Well, I guess it, I think it may cure an issue that we've, we've suffered through for a long time. So, uh, you know, schools have lost money uh, for years because of the tags not being properly. Being in there for discussion, if and when we go to a pay-as-you-throw type system, ever how that's going to be collected, as long as they paid for it, does it really matter where they're from? 
Chairman? Yes, sir. You're recognized. The request for information had six categories that included processing. The request for proposals has five categories excluding processing. Is it blended in the collection and transportation and we're getting into processing in this? No, the processing steps. Seven and eight, okay. Yes. And, and we can separate that out if you want me to, if you want me to, if, this was an attempt to say, okay, regardless of if you want to bring a material recovery facility, a compost site, a transfer station, a landfill, whatever, this is what we want, regardless of what you want to bring to our community okay. to help our. To so help I noticed ourselves. on eight, you, you get into the MRFs and so forth. So I should make sure I'm following, tracking. Oh no, please, I'm, I'm glad you do. Thank you. Uh, so now we're at material screening and Basically, the person that is uh, chosen or brings the facility here, person that wins the uh, contract would be responsible for monitoring materials. They would be responsible for any hazardous wastes that are accepted. Um, they have to have responsibility for what they're accepting. And so basically that's what that says, that the county would not ex be expected to be responsible for any of the materials that are, uh, that are accepted. The contamination piece is that second paragraph. Uh, all source separated materials shall be screened before transferring those to the type of facility, whether it's composting, material recovery facility, or otherwise. Did you have some? Give you a little example there. We pulled some numbers from last month. We hauled the, the uh, Commissioner Dodd mentioned the schools that would be considered single stream, paper, plastic, Cardboard, tin, and aluminum, no glass, goes into that product. We take it to a facility in Nashville and dispose of it. Uh, if it is clean, good quality product, we pay $55 per ton processing fee. And we receive nothing for it. If it's contaminated, then they'll estimate how much of the load is contaminated. So say, they say as well, 25% of it's contamination. Then they charge us $150 a ton on top of that 55 for that 25 percent so we spent uh 5362 dollars and 85 cents last month paying to get rid of single stream product from the schools if we take going to the same facility and we take a load of plastic that comes you know most of you have been to the convenience center you've seen our plastic containers they average about a half a ton it's a whole lot of airspace in those things uh, if it's good, clean product, they don't charge us anything. We don't pay anything. They just accept it. If it's not clean product, they charge us the $150 a ton for the percentage. Uh, glass goes to the same company, and that cost us $45 a ton for a processing fee. On top of that would be contamination on, on top of it. Uh, so we need to look at what it's costing us to recycle versus not recycling and that's going to be part of the, the process we had one rfi and i don't know if they'll do an rfp or not but it was basically an all-in-one trash container and they sorted it out when they got there that would re eliminate some of this type process uh, but most other areas most other governments in our area have discontinued some of it discontinued the recycling programs completely and some of them changed them quite a bit quite some bit so probably at our next public works committee meeting next month we need to discuss the single stream program at the school and maybe do away with it and just go to a paper cardboard only we can take paper and cardboard to a different facility and actually get paid for it but i asked the one in nashville if we'd brought you paper and cardboard mixed together what would that cost 55 dollars a ton because they have to separate it Matt, question for you i'm trying to get a visual picture in my head we've all seen the plastic containers at our convenience centers up, up, approximately how many of those containers make a ton of plastic at if it was if it was contaminated and it cost us 150 dollars a ton approximately hey, those containers average half a ton so two containers would equal a ton okay all right that's that's good information so again what Mac is what Mac is saying and reminding us and those who of us who are trying to stay on top of the recycling world 
there's no there's no market for it right now and there may not be a market for it for a long time yet to come and until legislation is put in place to ban certain manufacturing of containers single use in particular we we can't recycle enough to get ahead of the game because new material keeps coming into our facilities that we have to deal with so i say that to th mac reminds me of those comments that think you know something like uh what's the name of the company that makes the jet fuel fulcrum fulcrum, fulcrum. A, a technology like that that takes that nasty contaminated plastic and burns it to some kind of an energy oh, man why would you not want to talk to those folks it's just my thought because what better way to get rid of that single use contaminants to stay instead of instead of having to pay to get rid of it burn the dead gum stuff up and make some useful fuel or energy out of it but and, and i agree 100 percent with what you're saying but a fulcrum or of new earth energy wasn't that their name new planet energy new planet energy mm -hmm. both of them's gonna have a disposal fee they can't take that for for nothing they're not going to get enough money on the back end to pay for all the costs so there'll be a dump fee there okay i'm assuming they can burn the dirty stuff though yes yeah okay and and what max saying is one of the things that we talked about over the past couple of years as a group of solid waste directors in a round table when i was with gnrc we talked about what are the things we can look at operationally that will make recycling um, more successful or successful in what we do here in Middle Tennessee in our area. And one of the things we said was if we can all get on board with the same list of materials and we could go back to a short list of materials that we know have maintained or have the value has come back, like cardboard and mixed paper, um, metals, aluminum included, um, if we can get on board with a short list of those materials in all of the communities have the same list then all of a sudden it becomes easier for residents it becomes easier for facilities to know what to accept how to accept it what they'll get um, it's a whole lot easier to keep cardboard clean mixed paper clean than it is say glass or plastics of sort um, especially when you consider like a peanut butter jar is plastic these days yeah um, so so the contamination is less when you look at cardboard and mixed mixed paper and that type of thing I was just going to say that I, it, it may not be, Mr. Chairman, in our wheelhouse to for recycles. I mean, there's folks that specialize in this, whether it's in California or Florida or up north or overseas or whatever. There's different markets and different things because we've seen in the RFI that there's people that's interested, you know, in our recyclables that we have. And so, you know, we hear from time to time, we may be doing this and paying this, but then there's also this company that'll come down and get it for free. Or there's this company that will come over and get this and pay us for it. Yeah. Um, clean or dirty or whatever. And so, uh, you know, there, there's always somebody out there, but I don't think, you know, that's not necessarily our thing, you know, as far as researching those uh, recycle companies and for everything that we do because we're not really into that 100 percent right. we're, we're allowing on um, relying on people local or or close to us yeah. uh, for those answers and we're not into okay who in New York does it or or something you know there's there's other things out there that's what we're, I'm saying. we're just not exposed to it yet hopefully hopefully the propeller heads on these rfps will enlighten us yeah mac we're still old school yeah we're we collect it you bring it to us or we'll go to the school and pick it up and then we'll take the the truck and transport it to the facility that steve is talking about that will actually separate it package it and then sell it so if we bail you know separate it build it ourselves yes they would pay us for those things but we don't we don't do it that way we just just take it to them and let them go go on with it I remember as a county commissioner, we did the recycling thing back, Recycle Rutherford, y'all may remember years ago, and we did one of the first recycling 
pilot programs with a school in Smyrna. And uh, it, this was totally out of my district. I mean, I didn't have a school in my district at the time. And so I went over each week, you know, they would have like a little pizza party or something for the class who gathered the most uh, paper or cardboard and put in this container. And then I was down with the big celebration of them packing that. So you're talking about the most best uh, recycled container of stuff that was actually done perfectly and not only just not thrown in there stacked up so you <laughs> it's probably I don't know how many tons in that one <laughs> in that one container you know and no water got to it and all this sealed you know you open it up from the back uh, they had a big time with it you know it was awesome I tracked it and wanted to make sure well, okay how much money did they get you know for this thing they said it was contaminated. Well, how is, was it contaminated? They couldn't answer the question. Man, it just fired me up so bad because I think it was the norm of their recyclables that they got from schools or whoever was doing something. And they actually paid us for the tonnage because it was an enormous amount of tonnage, normal than, more than normal because it was stacked in there. You know, each class had their competition and stuff. And they paid us the full amount because it was the best. But when the guy come and picked it up from the truck and took it down there, it was just another load of recyclables. And so it was almost, and I'm not saying any names here because it's a long time ago, but it was contaminated. So it was kind of like a standard that they would say it's contaminated so that it would hit us with a fee or not pay us as much as we were supposed to get and I think that was taken away from the kids in the school and 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 you know what they had built up as far as recycling I mean those kids that's where we get our recycling from yeah is kids because they're going to take it home and say what are you doing dad throwing that in the trash you know you recycle it over here you know and that's where we get the recycling and, and I didn't want to bust their bubble on getting we had to pay to get that load taken instead of us getting that amount of money and I'm, that was I don't a, know if that's happening, but I, th I think maybe it is. That sounds like a bot lesson, but it was a public education bot lesson. So that it, it was a good thing at the end of the day. Yeah. Commissioner Dodd. Before we move on to transportation, just very briefly, the, the, t the tenor of, of this RFP is that, is, is leaving the, 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 mer the, uh, MRFs, composting, transfer stations, waste energy just wide open and let the proposers make suggestions is yes, how I'm sir. reading this? That's the goal. And okay, so that may open the door for public-private partnerships and owning and leasing back. Okay. And if there's something here that seems restrictive, please point it out because the goal is that we leave it, we want to let them know what we want or what we need, but we also want to let them have some leeway or some space to say, you know, we can we can recycle your electronics and this is the one and only thing we want to do. And they pick that one thing, they give us a proposal or they give us a response and that's that. Or we can do everything. We can do it all. So here's our, you know, here's our long range plan of however many pages that would be. If if we if we pigeonhole too tightly, then Max said it. We're going to restrict new school, teaching old school, what's available out there. That's true. Thank you. And I think we have to recognize on recyclables, Steve's example as well as others, um, it's truly just a game of economics, supply and demand. And so two, three years ago, you could get a contaminated load and you could get paid for it. We learned what contamination was. We'd never really mentioned that before. We just said rent your recyclables. Well, now we started to learn what contamination was. And now that one, you know, if, you, if you're doing everything right, and there are people out there that wash the recyclables in a dishwasher, if you're doing everything right and your neighbor's not and you use the same service provider, then your, all of your effort has gone for naught because their one peanut butter jar will contaminate the entire load, including what you've done. So I think that's a true public education piece of letting people know, you know, nobody ever knocks on your door and says, hey, that peanut butter jar just contaminated the whole load. So we've turned the whole load away because of your peanut butter jar. 
I think people would do the right thing. Ultimately, they want to do the right thing. They just don't know what that is. They don't know that they've done wrong. Uh, transportation to processing facilities and final management facilities. This is at the bottom of page eight. Um, basically, we're saying you should only use contained or enclosed um, units when transferring materials of any sort. Um, we do ask that you, you know, control the litter, anything blowing from vehicles. Uh, you follow all state, local rules and laws. Um, the one thing at the top of page nine, and you're going to see this twice in this draft. Um, while within the boundaries of Rutherford County, the successful proposer will route transfer vehicles on major through fares or highways. Travel through residential developments in the county will not be permitted unless absolutely necessary for local service delivery and approved by the county. I think that's important for you all. That's one thing that I heard repeatedly. So it's here as well as in the trans uh, transportation section, which we'll get to in just a second. Becky. Yes, sir. Or Mr. Chairman, yes, you know, we've said this a numerous amount of times and and even with our neighbor and where uh, the trucks come through how can we enforce that becky or how can we um make sure that that happens i, I don't really think um well, I would think stuff coming from Lebanon's probably going to come 231 up, you know, the stuff coming from Nashville probably is going to go Jefferson Pike or going to go 840 or whatever and get off there or Couchville Pike, I don't know. And then stuff coming from 24 or that end of the county or something's going to come down another way. I mean, how I, I I'm just asking a broad question here. I like it. Mm -hmm. But we've got to look at everything that we do. How can how can we enforce that into um, a contract, so to speak, or um, and or have teeth into it? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's typically, and I'll, I'll say my part, and then I see Matt has has picked up his microphone to speak as well. Um, Basically, there's a truck route. You can designate a truck route. You can say that in the contract, even if there's not a sign that says truck route. Um, residential areas truly do need to be off limits if for no other reason than you don't need, you know, the, the more large trucks you have in a residential neighborhood, um, kids wait for the school bus, and that's, that's just something you need to be mindful of. Um, overall, I think you can restrict their movement, but I also think that you can um, partner with your sheriff's department to say these are the areas, um, you know, these are the areas where we don't need big truck traffic or these are the hours. Uh, one of the things that I've done in the past is restrict our own trucks from going into school zones during, if a, if a school crossing guard is present, our trucks are not in that area at all. So if you need to, you know, if you need to change your route, change your route, but do not go in a school area if there's a school crossing guard present because that just puts us at more liability. So that type of thing as an operator um, is, is possible from an operation standpoint on their part. They can be mindful of those things. That would be in your contract with your service provider. Uh, basically, I think the, the simplest terms would be stay on state routes, uh, but then you're gonna have service services for you know customers that is not on state routes so they're going to have to be able to go pick up you know whatever their customers are or our schools or whatever uh one state route that can be on the do not travel list is jefferson pike uh back in the day when the blue team was bfi the the top dog at the company said you better not be on jefferson pike or you will be terminated you didn't see any blue trucks on jefferson pike <coughs> mr chairman yes sir <coughs> I want to share this. I was looking for this uh, back up for the last discussion. We were talking about the, the, the recycling and, and those products, and I was looking for this article. I remember seeing it, and it was right after probably about second month into uh, the pandemic when it hit us, and this came out from the EPA. It was dated May thirteenth, 2020. It says, Andrew Wheeler, the administrator of the U.S. Protection, or United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. He's recorded a video encouraging all Americans to recycle materials from their households, saying recycling is good for the planet. He says, right now, there is a critical need for raw materials in the manufacturing supply chain, especially paper and cardboard. 
because of everything that's being shipped through Amazon, all the PPEs and everything else, rubber gloves and, and things that because brought on by the pandemic, um, the raw materials that all these things are being made from uh, is a critical need. Uh, so recycling prices might, we might be coming into this at the right time by the time that we get our uh, <clears throat> this uh, RFP back we might see recycling make a resurgence. I was talking with one of our vendors today, and with the hurricanes that came through south of us, there's several large companies that's out of business. Uh, so they're looking for some of those recycled commodities to replace what they're not getting from those businesses that are shut down. And on the manufacturing side, you have a process and you have a time frame. If you think about a, an assembly line, um, you know, you have a certain amount of material you need coming in, just like you do any other type of process. You have a certain material you need coming in so that you can continue the process, whatever that is, whether it's building a car or, build, you know, making a cardboard box or, or you know, loading a landfill or, or a MRF. But as it, pro as it processes and continually works, you have to have a continuous feedstock, whatever the feedstock is. On our transportation, limiting the transportation on our residential areas and all, you could limit that back to the number of tires on the truck or the length of a truck, and that would keep your semis and stuff out of your residential areas. Your garbage trucks are a lot shorter than a semi, probably have less tires on the ground than most semis. I know I have seen single-tired semis some, but I think they've got more tires on the ground than just a pickup garbage-type truck. Good point. Okay. Facility conditions. Um, basically, we want them to follow all of the local rules and laws, state, local, state, and federal. Um, we want them to provide signage that is reviewed and approved by your county commission or this public works committee. Uh, we want the entrances to be Visibly, visually appealing and maintained in good condition. I think you can define what good condition is at some point specifically. Um, we want the entire site to be kept uh, in good condition. And this is where they also shall provide alternate locations for accepting the materials that they propose. In other words, we don't want a MRF sitting here that's full of plastic and they're actually holding on to the plastic here because the market has fallen off or because they can't get, you know, they can't get rid of it. Um, we want to make sure that that, that material continues to move, that they're not stockpiling things. Um, facility maintenance and operations, they shall repair all equipment. This just goes back to what we've talked about with the collection side of things, but it's from the perspective of equipment, the infrastructure, their buildings. Um, they will be responsible for adequate control of fire, noise, dust, odor, insects, that list of things there. Um, environmental permits. Prior to receiving the materials, they will demonstrate to the county that they do have the proper permits in place. Typically through TDEC, they may be air quality, they may be um, solid waste permits, they may be uh, stormwater or water permits, depending. Um, and then here's your county inspections. The county reserves the right to inspect the proposed facilities upon reasonable notice, provided such inspections do not unreasonably interfere with the operation. So basically, you all have the right to, to um, inspect those at any given time, as long as you say, hey, we'll be over in a couple couple of hours or tomorrow or what have you. Um, at the top of page 10 for accounting, this is where Mac mentioned a scale ticket. Most scale tickets have this information on them. So regardless, you want to know what materials they're taking, where they're taking it, um, what the weight of it was. There are several new computer programs out there that will give you that information electronically, but I did go ahead and include a three-part weight ticket. In other words, you want a truck driver to get one copy, you want the contractor to keep one copy for a period of time, and then you want to get one copy um, in, in, the, you know, at, in the county accounting office or in the solid waste headquarters office. Um, that way you have, at least have a documentation of what was delivered where and by how much volume. Um, summary reports, there's, there's the request for the monthly report again. Um, any state reporting, so annually, 
TDEC expects to get an annual progress report. And basically we're asking for a lot of general information. They do the MSW volumes, they do the recyclable volumes, they do tire volumes, where did you take your materials. So that's the type of thing we're asking them to, take, to keep track of through their facility. Um, and then for compost and recyclables, each proposer shall, shall demonstrate experience in, in execution as well as um, you know, the, the fact that they do have the experience that Steve mentions, they have the experience in long-term offtake agreements as far as selling the materials on the back end. Uh, Becky, a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, do, do we need to put language in here or do you think what you have is adequate in terms of if, if TDIC uh, uh, puts a violation on any of these uh, technologies or, or the companies, how that, that should immediately be reported to the county or to the mayor's office or public works department? It can I mean, be. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to assume that that would be done. I, I want that to be in writing somewhere that any report of violations, a copy of that needs to be to the... To the public works committee or to the to county, the county representative. Yeah. Perfect. That's And that's not a problem. Um, you would not necessarily normally, or you would not necessarily get that under normal circumstances. So so they're not just automatically going to send it to you from TDEC. Yeah. Um, it's something you can look online to find. You do have to kind of dig for it at times if it's fresh information. Okay. Is, um, that, is that a fair ask, though? Yeah, mm -hmm, okay. for sure. All right. At the top of page 11 is just our list of recyclables. Um, this came again straight from the RFI. We can add 2019. I know that Mac has those numbers. Um, the transportation piece, here is mentioned the, um, the trucking and the rail opportunities. The second paragraph is the paragraph I read you before that we've mentioned about going through residential areas. Um, Trucks fueled by, uh, this is the third paragraph down, second sentence, trucks fueled with compressed natural gas or electric engines are the newest technologies. Um, not, a, not opposed to that. No, it's new technology. No, those are options are out there. If you want to, you know, look at that and say, okay, there's a value to that or that's what I want more so than not. Um, when you start to get the proposals in and we start to actually look at those, is that something you're going to give folks points for? Or you're going to, you know, say, okay, that's a little more important to me than not. Um, rail opportunities do exist. Again, I don't think I don't think barge is an option out of Rutherford County. Um, and then, efficient, economically feasible transportation will prove to be a top priority because of the distance you could potentially be looking at. Mr. Chairman. Y yes, sir. Chairman Harris. Thanks. Number one, I want the public to know that I do not want to lock up convenience centers. Lock up, lock up convenience. Oh. <laughs> I do not want to do that. His, no. <laughs> his phone's been gone. My question is on transportation. If we can safe to say that someone wants to come in, build a transfer station, and ship our trash out. My, here's my, my problem. I've been a proponent of this because I'm very worried about fluctuating prices. And it's, would it not be smart to put in a time as far as like 10 years locked in price or something like that, because I'm scared that it goes from 40 to 60 to 70, and then all of a sudden this county's raising taxes to pay for it. And and with with landfill capacity being, you know, a question mark with the continuous growth in Middle Tennessee, as well as options, there there is not a company that I'm aware of as of now that has applied for a Class One permit anywhere in the state of Tennessee. So we're we're pretty much looking at what resources we would have as of today. Um, the prices you pitch are are pretty on target right now. Tip fees are between forty forty five dollars a ton. Um, transportation is a big piece of what you have to look at now. Typical contracts can say five-year increments, the ability to, you know, extend for five terms. Some will say um, 10 years on your first term and five-year increments beyond that. Um, 
you could say 25 years. I don't know if you can expect the same company to be in place, but you can certainly have the ability to renegotiate with a new company or, um, you know, we got to look at the thought of what will, what will 25 years from now look like? And, and I think it will be different. I don't know how different. I, I, don't, I don't know what that would be, but I think you are easily, you are more than welcome to in a contract say five years, five year increments, 10 years for the first, you know, for the first, term um, just like you would any other contract most of those are going to have cpi increases yearly and it'll be based on the southern market and you can put a cap on that a lot of places will say no more than such and such percent per year or per you know per increase some are increased every term or some are increased every year depending on what the contract is written to say I think we should put a time on it. I mean, five years to me is... is it goes by in a second. It goes by it goes, yeah, it's, it's so, a flash. So if we said 10, we can we we three can. years of 10, I mean, is that something that a company will go, you know, it's non-negotiable, no, we're not going to do that? Because I'm just trying to protect the county from, you know, prices going out. Because let me remind this committee that when uh, we had a vote on the... Uh, Republic, they raise their prices up, and I'm worried that you know they raise their price. You know, something happens, and then all of a sudden our prices get raised to seventy-five dollars a ton, and that's a big blow to us. So I'd like, you know, I think we should need to put some type of language in there where it is a year, you know, ten-year, five-year increments or something, but it needs to be to where we're locked in for a long term instead of you know. Or. Or, and maybe you said this and I missed it, you're locked in for a certain year period with a maximum percentage increase the the next three or four or five year term. I mean, I, I'm speaking from experience on a personal matter, but that's a possibility too, that here's your rate for the first five years, the next could go up to a maximum of X percentage. I'm just thinking a company may be more willing to discuss that kind of a agreement than a, we're going to hold you at the same price for the next 10 or 15 years. That that may be hard for them to swallow, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going and, back, and I'm going pretty, back to you too. Oh, that's pretty standard. Um, a CPI increase is pretty standard. Again, some of them, um, some of them are increased at the term. So you can expect a little bit higher price along the term to, to make up the difference along the years, or you can do an annual increase not to exceed 2% or 4%, whatever that percentage is. So that you do get an idea of the forecasted pricing and what you would expect as far as expenses. But the, the prices will increase. Um, we're we're, uh, we're could, low on capacity. You, you could do a <clears throat> three or five year with two year renewables and increments tied to the CPI index, which could get you into that 10 year span there's, there's just all different ways to create this as we move forward yeah three percent can add up well it's all right and that's that pricing has already happened over the past three years we've seen it march forward pretty quickly and it's gotten it's just it's just increasing continuously with with new bids that come out from different you know different communities so that's an expectation and it's a valid concern so will you will you star that in your margin that that would be a topic of discussion with potential partnerships hold, hold on phil we've got you're good okay so Sorry. so you may not be good okay I made the comment a while ago about no one in Middle Tennessee had uh, asked for a landfill permit in, a, in quite a while. I, I don't know about plans, but there has not been a, an application submitted. No, sir. Would, would you not think when the news gets out that where the 30 or 30 ever how many counties that's coming to Rutherford County with their trash, when they realize that is going may cease that the request for permits might increase. 
I assure you there are people looking for alternative locations and alternative ways of transportation throughout Middle Tennessee. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just uh, to, to Craig's point, do, do you think we need something in the proposal or we just need to anticipate that when we get to some contract conversations? I think it should be in the proposal. Okay. Well, let's, let's chat about that, Becky. How, how can we put in language that will protect ourselves from an inflation? So one of the one of the things I did was look at how this language has been written in other areas most recently. Um, you could say uh, something like, and I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor you by reading all of this, but quoted unit pricing will be adjusted annually to reflect a change in the cost of living. Um, no fuel charges will be allowed. Annual rate adjustment will be um, will apply to all unit pricing. So whatever the pricing is for any of the services at all, it would apply to all. Um, the annual rate adjustment will be predicated upon the consumer price index, which is pretty standard. Um, food and energy are often um, removed from the calculation simply because they're volatile. Uh, some, there is a garbage and trash category now, which I found, which was pretty impressive, actually. Um, I didn't realize it was out there. Um, and basically you say, okay, we're going to renew a contract April 1st of every year and we're going to use the numbers from March. Um, quoted unit pricing would be per ton or 2,000 pounds. Um, you specifically reject any fees, surcharges, or otherwise. Um, you do not, uh, in any year, the total adjustment shall not exceed 4% was what I had seen was pretty standard, but you can make that percent whatever you want that percent to be. So that's the type of thing that you see in other um, primarily landfill and or MRF processing type contracts, transfer station type contracts. Other thing you need to figure in on that is what you're asking for, uh, like the convenience center piece of it. If you were asking for a company to propose to take over the convenience center operation you're going to have to look at the expense that they're going to have to have to actually take that over if they bought out our fleet that's that's 11 route trucks a week is our roll-off fleet with five spare trucks if you go to a 77 hour work week you're going to need 11 to 12 more trucks you remember when we opened the bids the last time, they were somewhere around $160,000 for a roll-off truck. So that's a whole lot of trucks to be purchased. So if you're asking a company to do that, they're going to need at least, at minimum, a 10-year agreement. I think one of the things we need to be prepared for is that even though we're asking for a proposal that... Um, the proposals may come back to us one way with add-ons for some of the th additional things that we're asking for. I know when we uh, when we did the proposals for school construction, we would get what we asked for, but but a lot of times what we asked for were add-ons. So if, if we wanted specific things, we were going to pay for it too. So we need to be prepared that that they're not just going to single shot us one proposal. They may come in, well, if you want this, we would also need this. So there, there should be some negotiation uh, possibly uh, depending on what we accept. And I actually have that as a note. That'll be one one topic that we would talk about is how we'll evaluate them, what we'll look at more closely, what the point system would be. To, you know, what's more important? Is it important to you, or what's the value of a, a compressed natural gas or electric truck in your community versus a standard um, truck for service, or you know, whatever those things are that are most important. You know, I don't want to speak for Craig, but I, so I don't know that we're really getting into answering your question or your um, instinct to have something about price increases in here, could we have a more generic paragraph somewhere to, that would say anticipate price controls or renewals or 
because I agree with you, it's pretty loose on that, but it would also be very difficult to put language in every, all five categories, because they all may be different commodities. So I wonder if a, a statement, Craig, would be sufficient. I mean, I think that, you know, what I'm saying is going to be part of negotiations. I mean, you know, we're going to negotiate stuff, but what I'm worried about, I just don't want to have 4.4% year one, five, you know, and I want to try to protect us from that because I'm worried. I'll be honest with you, I've been a proponent of it because I'm worried about prices, worried about increases, and all of a sudden we budget five million and then turn around and we got to have 10. That's five cents. I mean, do you see where I'm going with this? So I'm just want to protect us, and I want them to get in their mindset that we are going to want a contract long term, or definitely not yearly, but you know, five years or ten years in that in that capacity. Because that's what I, I'm trying to keep our prices where we not have a five percent, five cent property tax increase because now it went up, you know, a substantial amount. If we have a number, then we know what we're dealing with. Exactly. And, and the landfill disposal was the largest operational line item in the city of Franklin budget, typically. And it was that was the only thing with landfill disposal in that one line item. So we could watch it closely and see what it did, you know, from year to year, because it was it was upwards of two and a half million dollars every year just for disposal. And on the top of page 12, we speak to landfill. We just say we would like them to, um, we do recognize a landfill would be needed. Um, landfill shall provide one scale um, during normal business hours at its own cost. You do have the opportunity to inspect the scale. I will tell you scales are typically calibrated and inspected at least annually for the state. Um, and then you get to the landfill mining and reclamation piece. These bullet points are, are a lot of what we've talked about over over time. I did um, talk with TDEC today. So my question to them was, if Rutherford County wants to be without the liability of the landfills, they, of the landfill space that they now own, what does that look like? How do they get there? And there were two options. Um, and, and again, I went strictly by, if you don't want the liability. One of them was to sell the property so sell the property where the class one and class three, four landfills are. Um, but basically TDEC will establish a new liability bond with the new owner. So basically you've sold it, you no longer own it, but TDEC takes that responsibility up with the new owner with a liability bond. The second is that you maintain ownership you reclaim the landfill space by removing any of the items in there that could potentially cause a problem. In other words, you take all of the waste and all of the soil out of that space, both class three, four, and class one space. And once those materials are removed, the testing continues. Once that, once that testing is back to what it would have been pre-landfill, basically you've gone back to what would be considered, and this is not the words they use, but this is what I picture it being is virgin land, what it was before landfill was there. And that would, main, that would be where you would maintain the ownership. Now if you go, you know, we've talked about class one space and other things. Um, we talked about class one space and other things. So basically you would go back to ground, you know, to, to the ground level and you would start with a permit fresh and this would be brand new. What did I say? So, uh, Becky, I'm sorry. Say that last part again. <laughs> um, if you look at the, are you talking about the class one space? If you, if you went in and wanted to reclaim, or I'm sorry, if you went in and wanted to get a new uh, space for a class one, you'd have to start yeah, over re repeat that. with a permit. So if once you claim it, once you go back to what the land is prior to it ever being a landfill, yeah. you would start the process for a permit fresh. It would be as if it had never been there from permit standpoint. The action law would apply at that point. Okay, you, you you said some interesting things that has a whole bunch of holes in it. 
um, first of all, the the first one, if he sold the property, you mentioned that T. Dick would say we have no liability. I kind of find that a little hard to believe. Um, I would certainly want to see that in writing, and you know, maybe some blood drops on the uh, near the signature. That's why I ask them. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if an owner ever escapes total liability of what you have underneath your soils that you put there. You, it may be, may be greatly reduced. But I don't know that you're ever 100% free from liability. So I, w I would love it if that was the case. And if TDEC wants to then take over our whatever remaining responsibility might be, more power to them. So that would be something I would really want legal to look into. And so the other thing, the part two, if we maintain ownership, but we reclaim the waste, and then basically you turn the land back into pre-landfill conditions, and then they use, I think you mentioned they test that. Well, how long, how long do they test that? For the next 40 years? They, they would continue testing the groundwater like they do now. They would continue testing what they do now. Um, and we're still, on, we're still on the, okay. So, so let's, I'm sorry to interrupt, but. Mm -hmm. We, let's say we reclaim it, mm -hmm. get it back to pre-landfill conditions. So, man, the, I mean, there's the wildlife, the fish are jumping, the tur you know, everybody, okay, everything's cool. Unicorns, the whole bit. So, but we're still on the hook, right? We're still on the hook until TDEC says, well, we're going to monitor this for X amount of years or whatever. And then when you pass so many clean tests, we would want to know how many years or how many tests, mm -hmm. how often they're going to test, you know, because they could, they could still drag you out for another 30 years if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So and, and, we and need clarification on that. And, and there would be if, a... If, if it came to that point, apologies. we would want clarification on that. And, and I, th I think you would. I will tell you there's a certain guideline they use now for, for testing. Yeah. Um, they're going to continue that process. The fact that this has not been done in the state of Tennessee to this ex extent, I would say they would watch this project very closely and want to be a partner in it yeah. um, and help you get where you want to be. I think they would be a supportive. Okay. Um, and was the last thing you said that if we take our current landfill back down to, if we, if we harvest it, take it down to pre-landfill conditions that then if we wanted to apply for a new permit to build a new landfill on that spot, we, we could do that? We, you, you can. We've talked about um, building a small area where you would put, you know, we've talked about building a small area where you would put any of the materials that are not yeah, good for, some, you know. Something's always going to have to be landfilled. Yeah. But anything from that site that you would put there and then any natural disaster debris, you could use your own site for that. But okay. you would start fresh as if it were, okay. as if there were never a landfill there. Gotcha. Okay, I understand. Got a question for me. I bet you do. <laughs> it's not what you think. Okay, <laughs> Commissioner Piercy. I had a gentleman come to me this week. He had, he had uh, done a lot of research on laws, law and landfill and airports. And he had a law that he had printed off that said no new landfill could be permitted within five miles of an airport. Is that true, or do you know? There, there is a law that says that there, that is part of the permitting application. Um, there have been landfills that have been permitted within that within that distance, but it depends on the type of airport, the size of airport, the flight pattern, and all those things. They look at it overall. Those are birds. Yeah, oh yeah, birds. Birds in plane. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Birds in. So planes. it doesn't necessarily limit it to a commercial airport. It could be. It could. It could be the. MTSU. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, he he had went to the extent and measured, and said, uh, and it's property to property. It's not actual runway to pile of trash. It's property line, and he said it was right at four mile. 
to the Republic landfill and our landfill. So I wondered if that would cause us problems to re-permit a spot on our landfill at any time. Or for construction for construction debris, it wouldn't be, I don't, that would all be at the time that you're trying to permit it, but it, and, and it's not road miles, it's by the way the crow flies. And mainly that law was put into place because of the number of birds that are attracted that they don't want in the flight pattern of planes taking off or, or landing. You know, so Actually, they, be closer the way the bird, uh, crow flies than it would on the road. Yeah. It'd be less than four miles. Well, uh, everything's subject to whatever the government wants to do, you got to abide by it at the time that you apply for it, you know. And I think a C&D piece for construction and demolition is a bit different than if you had um, you know, household waste. waste. Yeah. yeah, food waste and such. Yeah. So that would be a consideration for sure. All right. What's, uh, first of all, I'm going to apologize on behalf of staff and a, a, a somewhat reputable source that we did not get these drafts sooner in order to uh, review because um, it's kind of going yeah 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 so I, I apologize for that I'm not going to mention any names but <clears throat> the initials are <laughs> no but anyway uh, what what is our next step here we got a broad brush overview of, of the RFP draft are there do you feel in your heart and in your gut there are missing pieces still are you comfortable enough into uh, taking this document home, reviewing it one more time, having an, another meeting about this, and launching it? Or are you happy as it is written and we give Becky and the mayor's office the green light to publish? So what are your, what are your thoughts? What are your, what is the committee's wishes? My thoughts on it would be take it under advisement. Everybody go home and read it thoroughly. This is a very important document to this county and several other counties. It'd be one of the biggest decisions we'll most likely turn out. And I would, I'd make the motion to take it under advisement, come back for another meeting and go up or down. If you have any changes you want to make to it at that time after studying what's in it, and go from there. I don't really feel like, I know I haven't had time to look at it, for sure. So that's just my thoughts. And that I will make it in a motion or All right. whatever we, we need to do. We have a motion to take this document under advisement. We have a second from Chairman P. Uh, before, before I'll, I'll let Rachel go ahead and call the roll, then we'll set a date. Discussion, please. Yes. Are there going to be any amendments to this? Some of your notes, will they come out to make it a, we're going to take advisement under the new draft? And, and then we need criteria for evaluation and instructions for respondents as well. So we'll need to add those two sections in. We, we, haven't, cho we haven't talked about how we'll evaluate when we get these back. And, and we need to include at least a, a s short section on how, what we will look at or what we will consider. In terms of uh, uh, grading, or okay, does that can, can we can we launch the RFP to the public while we figure out our grading system, or are you suggesting we have to have one locked down before we send it out publicly? Typically, you tell you tell people in the RFP on the front end what you're going to be looking at more closely, or what you're going to consider the priorities. Um, how things are ranked. That doesn't mean you have to, but it does keep things transparent and okay. consistent. And we have sort of kind of danced around that a little bit in our RFI discussions. And I know there's other RFP examples that have some good comments and language about how to, how to grade and things like that. Okay. Uh, so that being said, 
if if we put that task on you, Becky, to uh, update this draft in our hands tonight with some comments that were made this evening, and then get that out to us. Uh, so we'll break it down into two pieces of of information. When would you be comfortable? And I'm not even going to ask our somewhat reliable source to comment. So when would you be comfortable in having that finished draft able to have Rachel email that to this committee? Friday would be fine. I can 40, do this 48 tomorrow. hours. There's okay. not a lot of there's not a lot of changes. Okay. Here. All right. And and then the next question is if you send that out Friday, we would have we would pick X amount of days to digest that and then set up a next solid waste committee meeting. Mr. Chairman. Yes. You had I was just taking a few notes and maybe I missed some. Becky hopefully has got them all. I've got just a few. Making sure what changes want to make and then of course the next meeting you may have more and that's fine. Like uh Commissioner P said, want to make sure this document is good as we can get it to send it out Th that uh, would be commissioner Pier commissioner piercy in i mean commissioner piercy yeah. what'd i say pete i'm pete. sorry commissioner yeah. piercy yeah. <laughs> commissioner p's up there yeah. sorry <laughs> okay 90 days max uh page five number three add memorial day labor day page five number eight uh go through public works uh, also a note inspect each site every two weeks at convenience center also wording to keep convenience centers clean and operable was there others becky that i might have missed on Did, that when i walked out when i stepped out of the room was there any closure on uh an index on the uh fee or, or the am amount the inflation or the well, Becky was stating that uh, you could put that. I can put that language in percentage, there. Mm -hmm. no more one or two percent or something a year or something. But I don't. I don't. I can insert that language maybe in the accounting section, and y'all can take a look at okay. what it you know what it's looked like. You'll, what it, she'll wordsmith something, and we'll look at it after Friday. I don't disagree. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement. Uh, all right, so let's go to part B then, the, uh, the grading system. How, how, how many days do you need to prepare a draft for us to review that, to start the discussion on grading? For the evaluation piece, um, I have some good ideas from what we've done with the RFI. I would say at least, at least a couple of weeks to get a good draft to you. Okay. Um, All right. Give you some options to look at. Okay. So, then let me ask the question: Do we want to go ahead and get her draft on Friday, and then set a meeting up, perhaps next week, to just review the draft? and then hopefully put some finalization to that. And then we will wait for the draft of the grading system and then put that on the calendar perhaps. That will get us back into first of week or so in November. Uh, is that acceptable? Does that sound like a logical path to follow, Mac? On your grading system, this is for me, and I don't even have a vote in this thing. But if I were voting on it in the grading system, I would want to know, are you wanting money from us as far as help building your facility? Are you wanting property from us? Are you wanting to partner with us? I think some of those type of questions in the grading facility would be very important to know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I might not ask them exactly that way, but I would uh, ask, ask what the needs or expectations would be from the county. Um, all right. So. Let's go ahead and set a, a meeting for review of the final draft. And today is what, the 14th? 
Okay, it looks like we have, it looks like we have the 20th and 21st. 21st was, is a Wednesday, which kind of seems to be our normal, or, or the 28th seems to be our normal meeting dates for this meeting on Wednesdays. Um, first of all, is that, uh, are there any of those dates uh, bad for anybody? 28th. Becky and I both will be out of town. The 26th through the 20, I'm sorry, the 26th through the 30th, I'll be out. I, I'm sorry, say that one more time. I lost attention span. I'll be out of town on the 21st, and I thought Becky was too, but hers is the it's next week. It's the week. next week. Okay. All right. Well, does it have to be on a Wednesday? Could. She's going to make it on here. Okay. Are you. Are you going on the 20th, Mac? Do you leave to part on the 20th? No, I leave on the 21st. What does everybody's calendar look like on the 20th, which is Tuesday? Becky? I'm good. Good? All right. All right, let's, uh, let's put down September 20th. I'm, I'm sorry, October, October 20th. Uh, 5.30 still good, or do you want to push it back a half hour or anything, or forward a half hour? All right, 5.30. Solid waste. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure we need to set the one two weeks out at that point. Do you, do you, do you guys want to kind of pencil in a two week from now, I mean a two week from the 20th date for the, uh, not questionnaire, the evaluation discussion? Or do you want to just wait till the 20th and make that decision? That will give Becky uh, one more week of kind of preparation. Let's wait, okay, thank you. I need to somebody just to make a decision. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been one of those days. <laughs> there is a live motion on the floor. Rachel, will you please do roll call on? Yes, sir. The motion on the floor. Commissioner Dodd. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Piercy. Yes. Commissioner P. Yes. Commissioner Sherino. Yes. Commissioner Blair. Yes. Chairman Cush. Yes. All right. Any other comments, Becky or Mac or old business, new business, Commissioner? Chairman Pierce. Cush. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Let's uh, let's fall to Chairman P. If you don't mind, Chair Chairman P. You're recognized. On that vote we just took, I would request that when we do have uh, uh, the notes corrected and we get those sent to our committee that we also put copies in all the commissioners uh, mailboxes that way they can kind of keep up if they want to as we're going along yeah rachel said she's very happy to do that all right thank you yes sir good point uh chairman pierce Chair commissioner piercy i've had several people ask could they come to these meetings mayor are these meetings open now or are they still just virtual only. Yeah. There, yeah. Public can attend. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, we they just we would prefer that they try and keep a six foot social distancing, but yes, these meetings are open to the public. As as uh, I understand, all county meetings are now open to the public. Anything else? Thank you all.